I'm going to sit down because I've been taking notes on the first two speakers, and I don't want to forget some of the connections here. Um, but before I start, I'm, I'm curious to know in the audience, how many of you are breeders but don't live on a farm? So there's quite a, quite a few. Um, how many of you are farm owners slash breeders? A lot more. Okay, and lastly, how many farm managers or farm owners who are managers at the same time? Okay, we need more farm managers for the next meeting because this is a, these topics, well, I guess what we're saying here is that a lot of the owners are the managers, but, but it's important to bring your people to these things too because this is a, these are critical things. Um, Joan has tasked me with um, full to yearling acquired confirmation problems and uh, we're gonna uh, look at developmental orthopedic diseases including physitis and OCDs we're going to talk about acquired flexural deformities, which is different from congenital. Congenital is what was just covered by Lois, which are things that horses are born with versus injuries that are caused, acquired. Uh, not necessarily injuries, but things that happen developmentally. And then we're going to talk about angular uh, limb deformity, uh, causes treatment, and location-based corrective schedule, which gets to the young man the rights question just a minute ago. Um, Developmental orthopedic disease. Um, contracted tendons, which is the next page, is going to be the ones you hope you don't get. These are the injuries that probably got overlooked, the problems that happened that should have been, <coughs> should have been noticed, and, and definitely the oopses. Um, acquired angular limb deformities, which will be the second one we cover, uh, is going to be more about corrective trimming and staying on top of your babies. Um, Physitis and osteochondrosis um, are, are problems that are due to quick growth or overfeeding typically. Uh, nutritional problems, a lot of times they're also genetic problems. Um, and the causes in general below there, um, you see the four. I mean, this is what we've been talking about all day actually. Genetics, do you have good animals to start with? Are your animals more prone to these issues time after time after time. As, as Seth said, if you look at the buyer's guide and that mare has produced a $5,000 full, a $4,000 full, a $1,200 full, and a $5,000 full, was it the husbandry that caused it or was it the mare and the stallion that caused that full to have those issues? I think it's important that you realize that right off the bat, uh, especially when you buy a mare, if you're buying a mare at public auction, to research what her foals were like. and if. If you have the knowledge to do as Richard said and, and know a family well enough to know what those babies look like out of that family and whether they sold well and looked good and so on, then you're a step ahead of the guy that's just holding his hand up and taking a pot shot in the ring. Um, those are the things that can help you be a better breeder by knowing those things and by tracking them and so on. Here's the, uh, here's the contracted tendon that was caused by um, an injury, um, often by disuse of the limb. You'll see, uh, you'll, you'll see in issues like the picture on the right caused by a really bad foot, a foal that gets, uh, you know, this, this again, you, you don't want to have this. If you see this picture up here and it looks, reminds you of one of your foals right now and you haven't called the vet yet, it's a little late. Um, Joan gave me some really nice slides. These are... <laughs> um, Mostly, you know, the thing that you can, you know, you can't control every injury in the first place. If you've bred horses long enough and you've been around horses like me, you are going to have horses that uh, are prone to injury. You are going to have situations uh, with horses and you're just going to have percentages in mother nature and you're going to have to come to grips with the idea that you can't control everything. Um, but you can try to control everything and if you're manic like me, you will and uh, try to just do the best you can. But you, you have to come to a, a level of peace with yourself where you can say, I did my best and, and you raised a good product and, and other people you know, are, are gonna let it kind of go as it goes and, and hope for the best. Uh, somewhere in the middle is where you've gotta be on these things. Excessive overfeeding though is one thing that you can control and that, that will cause a problem like this. Um, we've talked about it over and over again, feeding the animal for, for the individual. 
Um, you know, if, if you're overfeeding and your horses don't look good to, to you, well, I, I should say if, if a professional comes and looks at your horses and is critical of their weight or condition, I think you should be concerned. A lot of times it's hard to look at your own horses and get that right away, especially if you're not very experienced. Um, there's a lot of pride and you, somebody comes into your farm and, and says, oh, that's too skinny, that's too fat, that's too this, that's too that. Try, try to remove yourself a little bit from the situation and look at and, and take the, you know, you wouldn't have invited them there if you didn't trust their opinion. So uh, try to take the, the criticism uh, constructively and, and avoid overfeeding. Um, Treatments for things like this, if you should get one, are, are you know, as Seth said, Oxytet is great. Uh, splints and bandaging, I, I hate also. I, you know, um, I'm generally for keeping horses happy and healthy and, and not getting into situations like this. And if you have to deal with it, you, you will, of course. Um, I think that, that thankfully I haven't had one of these, so I'm just going to move on. <laughs> This is more important. This is the second uh, developmental orthopedic disease that we're going to talk about, acquired angular limb deformities. Uh, we're going to talk about causes, treatments, and then timing for treatments. Um, trauma and infection are, are the, uh, the, it's the first thing, the first cause, and these are young, full things. Uh, I think some things have already been touched on here. Um, Joan just mentioned uh, checking full IgGs and making sure they're 800 or better navel care, septicemia. I mean, so much goes wrong in the first couple of weeks with joints. Um, you know, getting a septic joint is, is just a real, um, it's a real issue, and you have to be very careful of that. Hopefully, you're not going to have too many. Um, taking temperatures on foals and monitoring full daily health for brightness and uh, monitoring the suckle and, and how much uh, the, the foal is nursing. Those are things you really have to be cautious of and, and careful to, to keep an eye on. Um, you know, when, when you get into foals that aren't doing well and that are predisposed to infection of the joint plate, you, you get it, you're just getting into more and more dangerous water. So good horsemanship uh, will, will save you a lot of time when it comes to these next things. We talked about genetics already and nutritional imbalances. Uh, in genetics, I always say it's born the way you bred it. Uh, you know, we'll, we breed a lot of horses, and I, I'm very proud to, to work for Mrs. Malloy and to work for my parents and, and work on breeding horses. And now and then something will be born and, and uh, we'll look at it. And uh, my dad and I were laughing about this in Ocala last, last winter because there was this foal and it really wasn't very good looking. And, and you know, well, well, what's the pedigree? And well, oh my God, well, you know, who bred this? You know, and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, you have to kind of. Uh, you know, you really have to be careful about these things. You, you really need to give a lot of thought to your, to your breeding. And uh, sometimes you have some people that really do and some people that kind of that mix the medicine the, the day before, the night before. Uh, one of the things you can control in this business is who you breed your mare to. So that's your ultimate decision as a breeder and that's the ultimate responsibility and that's what's gonna give you the ability to sell a horse for good money and, and raise a, I should say, raise a good horse, sell a good horse, and hopefully that horse wins and makes breeders awards. Um, we talked about valgus and varus. Uh, toe win is much more common. Uh, valgus, I, I don't really, I don't really worry about so much. Um, it's self-corrects typically. Uh, when you get to, um, you know, two months and it's still really towed out, that's when you're gonna to start to think about a screw. Um, but we've also talked about daily and weekly confirmation evaluation. Um, just a comment about living on a farm and owning a farm, which I'm sure from my earlier questions, most of you know, you know, a lot, well, a lot of you have other jobs too. Some of you aren't full time on the farm. So your daily life is fix the fence, fix the water, Call the clients who mare fold last night. Call the one who's sick. Call the pain in the ass guy. Where's that employee who didn't show up? There's a lot going on. Some of you probably like to ride a horse and enjoy yourself, and that's why you got into this to begin with. Um, some of you volunteer at the NYTB and various other places. It's a, it's a busy day. Make sure you keep time every day to look at your horses. 
keep in mind that your product and your ultimate success depends on what your horses look like. Um, you know, I look at my horses as often as I can. I don't think that once weekly is enough. For those of you that don't live on the farm, it's probably as much as you can do, but make sure your farm manager is looking at your horses every day. Make sure someone's responsible for, for feeling joints, especially on young foals, taking temps, keeping a good record of that, because that horsemanship will prevent most of these problems. But if it's not taken care of daily, you'll be a week behind or two weeks behind by the, by the time you notice it yourself. Next, we're going to talk about acquired angular limb deformity and treatment. Um, I'm definitely for the conservative treatments that are listed here. I think for the most part, if you have good stock, those are the treatments that you're going to primarily be concerned with. Um, trimming the foot every two weeks is necessary in foals, at least looking at the foal with your farrier every two weeks. Uh, as a foal gets a little older, you'll go to four weeks, and I trim my yearlings every four weeks. Um, I will go to five weeks in a really dry summer if, it's, if I don't feel like their feet are growing that much, but typically for Saratoga sale yearlings, I'm on their feet four weeks or even three weeks if I feel like they're required. Um, it's probably, probably the most important thing you can do, and it's a hard relationship because farriers tend to do surprise attacks. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there on Thursday and they show up on Wednesday, or they, I'll be there on Saturday and they show up on Sunday. Um, but you know, having a really good farrier and a good relationship with a farrier makes this a whole lot easier, so that it's a, so that you're on the schedule, and that person is coming by at a certain time each month to do your work. And I, I would ask you to, to make time for the farrier yourself so that you're there when he trims. I think that's a really important way to notice the changes your foals are making and to keep notes of each farrier visit. Um, if you're not doing it day to day, like Seth and I said, you know, you probably should be at least try to keep notes on your, during your visits. Um, I think it's important, we talked about um, uh, Equilox as a way to uh, support is the word that we commonly use with our foals, but to to protect the outside of the foot if it's if it's breaking the other way, um, to try and steer the the hoof capsule by protecting the edge of the the foot, so that your foot is a good shaped foot. And as a, a buyer, uh, one thing that I look for is a good foot, and it's no foot, no horse. It's um, the oldest saying in the book. So. Uh, the protection of that horse's hoof capsule when it's young and the, the proper shaping of its foot as a young short yearling into a sales yearling is going to get you a lot of points with, with professional buyers. If you're, if you're commonly criticized for raising a horse with a bad foot, um, you need to talk with your farrier or change farriers. But a, a good foot will be a broad foot, not a narrow foot, but it won't be a flat foot. So there, there is a, a certain degree of angle, uh, which maybe goes back to the lady's question with the gray sweatshirt there, that, that you will come to recognize as a good foot angle versus a bad foot angle. And that will come with experience, obviously, um, but you'll probably learn it by producing one that, that isn't as good. Uh, if you do get into more aggressive uh, surgical treatments, um, there, there are lots. I mean, PEs, periosteal elevations are, are good, and they promote growth in the, in the side. What you're, when we go back to those blocks, and we're talking about the blocks all lining up the right way, uh, if one side of the joint's growing quicker than the other side, uh, you need to either encourage the other side to grow or restrict the growing side from growing too fast. So um, PEs, more or less think about it as unzipping the, or lifting the envelope flat, let, let the bone grow a little quicker, versus a screw restricts the growth plate from growing. So you, you've got that leg growing and the, the joint is shifting this way, or shifting this way, in or out, um, you know, which one are you going to, which one are you going to do? Are you going to encourage or inhibit? Now your veterinarian probably has a favorite trick and, and that's where, um, 
you know, your team becomes so critical. Um, you know, we try not to do a lot of screws um, because it's, um, it's invasive. I mean, really, it's, it's another way for a fold to get an infection. It's another bandage that needs to be changed so it doesn't get a sore. It it's, can be hard management. It makes management harder. But, but a screw is the best way to fix these issues, in my, in my opinion. Um, there are people that, that inject joints with, um, with iodine. And there are veterinary clinics that inject joints with iodine to cause growth one way or the other. Um, you know, people have lots of, uh, breeders have lots of different tools that they can use, and veterinarians have lots of different experiences that they can use, and each one is going to be a little bit different. Uh, this, Joan labels herself as a rude and riddle girl, so these, these treatments under aggressive surgical treatment are, are more like what Rudin Riddle would, would promote as methods. Uh, certainly Rhinebeck, uh, which Mrs. Malloy uses, or, or Haggard's, which is another big clinic in Kentucky, who would have different treatments. But this is, uh, you know, this is what they, they like up here. Um, I think we're talking about carpus knees and, and uh, um, I'm sorry, varus knees and valgus knees up here. Hawks are also interesting and um, some of the pictures Lois showed remind me of some of my worst foals, and uh, I think it's really important to watch where the hoof breaks over in a young horse and to monitor where that point is as the horse walks towards you. I think that answers, is it towed out too much, is the, you know, a lot of times you'll get those, those hocks that are really windswept, uh, varus hocks, and the horse will be breaking over over the side of his foot. And that's, that's when you need to get your, I mean, as you notice that the first time is you should get your extension on and get that support to the outside of that horse's foot so that he starts to get his leg up underneath him a little better. So the corrective schedule, the, the main thing to remember is that horses grow from the bottom up. They're born so they can run immediately or within, hopefully within an hour or so. So their legs, their pasture, and if you've ever noticed on a foal, it's about 90% of its mature length. The cannon bone is gonna grow another two or three inches. The radius is probably gonna grow five inches more. But the girth and the withers are gonna grow. They're gonna double or triple, they're gonna triple to quadruple in size. So what I'm saying is that those growth plates on the lower joints are gonna close much quicker than the growth plate plates in the higher joints. So that's why we focus on the bottom joints first versus the knees and the hocks later. Uh, no one really messes with elbows uh, or higher joints. So we're looking at basically at knees, ankles, and hocks. Um, the major things here, um, well, we've talked about a lot of this, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go over it again. But uh, one thing about knees, I think, is that you can do knees if if you have a May full and you're going to a yearling sale, and and I've actually bought yearling a yearling at a yearling sale and put a screw in its knee after the yearling sale. I mean, it's amazing that a knee is still that immature that it can be can be shaped. But that is a, that is a, and I'm not recommending that you all go out and do this, but, but that is, it's a, it really is that much behind the other joints as far as maturing the lower joints of, of the ankles. Um, my experience in, in towing in various weanlings is that you can buy them and with corrective trimming, you can hold them. Uh, they don't usually get a lot worse until after the um, sort of optimal age that we're talking about. As Seth said, a, a five-year-old marrow toes in will be really towed in by the time she's, you know, 18. But if you if you buy a foal that's a little towed in, it's probably going to still be a little towed in when you sell it as a yearling. It's probably going to be a lot towed in as a four-year-old and more towed in as a six-year-old and progressively worse and worse. Whereas with a, a towed out, um, valgus weanling, it will probably improve as the body widens. Although, more time than not, if it's 
below the ankle, the ankle joint's already going to be closed, so, the, so it's still going to toe out below the ankle, and the leg is going to come around and make it look a little better, and then you can trim it so that it, it breaks over to the inside of, the, of center, and it will probably track okay. But if you, if you can't quite get to center without getting a paddle, uh, you know, as the horse comes through and his leg's rotating, you're going to have a, a situation where, where it was too towed out and should have probably had a screw before 90 days old. But at that point, you've got what you got because you can't change it. You're already at, you're already at yearling sales time or two months before. So there, those are a couple of things just to experience. Um, the, the risk, obviously, in a towed-in horse, buying, you know, at the weanling stage, turning into a short yearling, is that the knees wide, widen too, um, because then you end up with a bow-legged horse. I mean, it's one thing to have a towed-in horse. It's another thing to have a really bow-legged horse. I mean, a bow-legged horse is probably going to be very hard to sell. Um, so what I look for is really open, wide joints in short yearlings. And by that, I, I want you, you want to look at, like, their look for physitis and look for really um, unusual sort of quick growth. And that often happens in the spring. Uh, so you're feeding your horse, you're feeding your horse, it's a good winter, you're throwing them alfalfa, and the next thing the grass comes and you're still feeding him and throwing him alfalfa, and now he's also eating fresh green grass. But you didn't really put that into your calculation because you're feeding your horse and you told your farm manager to keep feeding the horse. Well, the grass comes and all of a sudden, boom, your horse is obese and his knees are gone wonky. And, um, you know, you have to be really in control of what the nutritional intake is. It's not just what you're feeding him. It's what your farm is also offering him. A third type of uh, developmental orthopedic disease is epiphysitis, um, commonly referred to in humans as growing pains or swollen joints, again, from overfeeding and lush spring paddocks. Uh, I also think hard ground, to some degree, uh, bruising and running. And if you have a, a mare who's one of those mares who just won't relax and go out and drop her head and graze and she's got to run the fence, her foal's going to chase her. And that's a major problem, uh, especially if you've got a foal that's predisposed to, you know, bad conformation to begin with. So, so there he is out there trying to keep up with the milk machine, running around for six hours a day. Uh, he's not getting the rest and letting his joints get the rest to settle and grow straight. And what will happen is you'll see a fat joint one day and it'll be hot. If you're used to feeling legs, you'll feel the difference. Um, a lot of people, I mean, the best way to do it is to restrict exercise, in particular if you have a mare that runs. Um, some people will use mud. Uh, I'll, I'll use mud. Uh, I have an advantage in that my wife's a veterinarian, and, and she'll, she'll tell me, you're doing that so you feel better. And it's true, actually. I do feel better. <laughs> I don't, I think that in some cases you just want to be, if, you're, if I'm making someone put mud on it every day, I know they're looking at it. Uh, so that's something that you might want to, to think about. Um, it's very hard. I mean, you can use supplements if you get physitis. Um, probably the most important thing you could really consider to do is to wean the mare. Um, you know, if the foal is, is drinking too much really rich good milk and it's been on the foal too long, that's probably your cause for physitis. Um, but definitely think about uh, decreasing your exercise. Um, I think that this is one of the key conditions that, that, as a manager, you can control. I mean, year after year, if you're getting physitis on, in your full crop, it's something that you can change uh, to, so that you don't have that problem. And you have to be able to recognize that and, and move on. Lastly, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but uh, developmental orthopedic disease, uh, osteochondrosis, okay, um, it's a disruption in, in the growth of cartilage. So um, I actually bought a foal one time that was two weeks old. It was a granddaughter of Dahlia, which probably Seth worked for or knew Dahlia at Alan Paulson's farm. But you know you don't get these opportunities to buy these great female families all the time, and this was a, um, a death. So 
in the fam you know the breeder died and and the, saw that suddenly there were these amazing fillies that were for sale so um my client said well can we x-ray and i said well i i don't know i don't recall in the 20 years that i've done this that we've ever x-rayed a foal at two weeks old but let's do it so we we x-rayed it and i mean uh this thing had a ocd in every single joint and well naturally i got to think about that and that's because the major cause of OCD is that it's, it's not formed bone. It's actually referred to as a lucency, which is the third thing down on that list up there. So in every joint, as that cartilage turns into bone, uh, if you x-ray it, when it's still cartilage, it's gonna look like a lucency. Uh, this is a, my experience. So often caused by immaturity. Um, you are also gonna have, as horses mature, they're going to mature with some deviations in that cartilage. In other words, not to a smooth joint surface. You're gonna get some that develop cysts in that surface, and some where those cysts actually communicate to the joint, and where uh, they'll open or they'll shed debris or the cartilage will be uh, fragmented, and, and those are surgical fixes. Um, Osteochondrotus dissecans, dissecans is surgical. That's where they go in, and there's a piece floating in there, and they pull it out. Now, if you're talking about the, um, if you're talking about a, a lateral stifle OCD, they're, the way the surgeons are these days, they're probably going to pull it out, and it, it may never bother the horse. If you're talking about the middle of a stifle, it might be a really big issue that the horse will never recover from. So location, location, location. It's not just real estate. Um, it's where these, where these lesions are and really how adept your surgeon is at getting in and out of there without, and debriding enough, but not too much, that, uh, that, that you have something left to sell. Um, I found with subchondral bone cysts that they're really bad in the ankles when you try to sell them, but they actually race pretty well. Um, I found with, uh, with lucencies and some of my best pin hooks, I think are in late foals uh, with lots of lucencies that just mature by nature, but that um, typically other veterinarians, um, buyers, don't want to take the risk that they will mature. Most yearlings uh, on root and riddle repository sheets will show lucencies in the mid sagittal ridge and the front ankles. They might as well not even read the x rays, that, that's what they write. So. You know, we, we become very accustomed as buyers to what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, and, and trying to um, figure out what really needs to be worked on. As a buyer and a seller and a breeder, what you've got to do is educate yourself in this area in particular because the repository x-ray critique has gotten so exact and frankly brutal. Uh, there's a lot more horses on the market than, than there are buyers. So a buyer has become extremely finicky about what he will take and what he will not take. And our risk-averse society has, has produced a buyer who really wants a clean horse. And rather than pay a discount and explain to his owner why he took the discount, he'd rather keep looking for the clean, the perfectly clean horse. But your job as a breeder is to understand that when your veterinarian writes lucency in the mid-sagittal ridge, it's not to tell the buyer it's okay except for the OCD in its ankle. Because a lucency in a mid-sagittal ridge is there in 90% of yearlings. And for you to understand that and to be able to tell people that it's not the end of the world, it's not a death sentence, and this is a good horse is important. Meanwhile, it's also important that you understand when your horse has a subchondral bone cyst in his ankle, that you can't go tell the, the buyer that he's clean. Um, th that's not clean. And, and even though it might be a decent risk for racing, it's not a clean horse. So um, a, a little bit of knowledge on, on these veterinary issues that you're going to be called on as a horse breeder and seller will go a long way. Um, and I, I think that if you could uh, learn those three areas so that your vet reports are more understandable to the yearling buyer, you'll do well. Um, the last, uh, on the bottom right there, treatment and prognosis. Um, I think that the most 
um, I, I guess preventive maintenance as far as OCDs is, is to do a set of survey films. Uh, survey, survey films are often done from anywhere from January to April on your probably your more valuable sales yearlings. I don't know if you want to do it. It's kind of like insurance. You don't necessarily insure every horse. But you at least want to know where you are on your more valuable sales yearlings. And I, I call it preventive maintenance. It, you know, it's not going to cost you the same as a full set. But, but shooting ankles and knees and stifles to know where you, if you've got a serious issue that needs surgery can help you. Now, if you find that you're shooting uh, survey x-rays and you're doing P1 surgeries and then you're getting more P1 chips when you re-x-ray in the summer, uh, you'll, you'll probably decide not to do every P1 chip that you find in the winter. And, and that is my experience. Um, I will go after more serious issues like stifles, God forbid knees, but, but a lot of times I, I don't mess with P1 chips unless, uh, unless I feel lucky. I often feel like the, the best time for a yearling to be outside is the spring when the green grass comes and the worst time for him to be on his stall for two weeks after a surgery and two weeks of hand walking is April or May. So um, try to get your surgeries done earlier so that if they've got to be in a stall and so on, it's the nasty part of the winter anyway, and then you won't be losing the bump that you get from spring grass. So you kind of let nature work for you a little bit in that way. Um, but try to, get, try to get at least some of your horses x-rayed. I think you'll find that it's good practice and um, it'll avoid that really unfortunate surprise of, of x-raying them for the first time two days before the sale and finding out that that lump in his ankle really is something bad. So I think that uh, gets me to Q&A. Uh, what is your feeling on, on doing early surveys on weanlings if you're shooting for the weanling sales? I mean, you're saying that you're going to have lucencies everywhere. Is it worth bothering with early x-rays? Uh, well, Windstar, my, my wife's the veterinarian at Windstar, and they have 140 mares, and they will x-ray weanlings that are not going to the sales. But they don't x-ray before, if, if a horse is going to the sale, to say the November sale, they would x-ray then if they had something, they would do the surgery, and if they still wanted to sell it, they would sell it in January. So they don't do an x-ray in August, if that's what you're asking. All right, so this goes back actually to uh, Lois's part, if you don't mind me backtracking to make a couple of comments. And Mike, I don't know if you can skip back to page 20 or not. Um, but um, one thing I think when we're evaluating foals for um, uh, limb uh, deformities and things like that. It's really important that you um, make the distinction, you and your blacksmith, or you and your vet, make the distinction between rotational um, deformity and angular deformity. And that I, it was partly my fault when we proofed this thing that I didn't think about this, but that foal on the right in particular when you look at it, it's really important that you get in front of the knee in other words, you can't really evaluate both legs properly by standing right directly in front of that foal. That foal, you need to move to each side and get in front of the knee to really determine whether you've got a rotational uh, problem or you have an angular deformity, which will really help you uh, in determining how you want to try to correct that foal. Right, looking at that foal right now, you'd say, well, you know, you've you got a problem with that, well, maybe both front legs, angular-wise, but I think once you, when you would get in, a, in front of that foal's knees, you, you, would, you would see that it's not nearly as bad as, as that picture would, uh, would indicate. And that would definitely uh, help determine how you would uh, try to correct that foal. And the other thing, um, when we're de uh, looking at, uh, when we're trimming babies, when you're looking at them with, with your uh, farrier, you need to really look at the, um, the angle of the pastern compared to the angle of the hoof and make sure that that is the same angle. That's, you want that to be a straight line. You'll notice occasionally on foals that they will start to get the, um, the pastern angle will be greater than the hoof. In other words, the hoof is more upright than the pastern, which will, um, and if, if that's not corrected, continued to be corrected, then you're gonna get a foal with a clubby foot. So, um, you know, you won't need to keep the heels trimmed on a foal like that to try to keep that angle, and, and generally you can, if, if those foals are kept after, you can really avoid that. But um, 
you know, I think that's just another, you know, that foal has to be evaluated from the side. And uh, I think it's really, just really important that, that you look at that. Just a little insight into that slide. And Mal may be familiar with this because he's seen these legs before. This is actually one of our foals. And uh, I cheated because the foal was born that way when I, I didn't have a, a slide of uh, an acquired. So that foal was born that way. And although Bill and I are both veterinarians, uh, we try and lean towards trying to correct everything conservatively if we can. And that was dealt with just with trimming. And by the time this foal was a yearling, I think it sold for 50, 60,000, which was good for the stud fee, went on to be a successful racehorse, all just with trimming. And all we were trying to do was kept bringing that hoof capsule back into balance because what happens when your hoof capsule's out of balance that one side of the epiphysis that's growing in that bone keeps getting beat up. Mm -hmm. And when you, and that foot wears that way, and when you bring it back into balance and you keep doing that, you're taking that pressure off, you're putting the pressure back on the other side, and it's a natural way of correcting that imbalance and growth. Not as easy with the other one, which is varus and actually is uh, acquired, but anyway. So sorry for cheating, but that foal turned out just fine. And <laughs> although I, I, I am a rude and riddle girl, <laughs> I consult with them a lot, um, we really do think that a lot of this can be corrected if you get on it early without using surgery. Other questions? When you talk about the aggressive surgical treatments in the PE, how does that compare to scraping, or is that the same? Same. It's the same thing. When would you start transitioning a uh, yearling, weanling, to uh, f off marin foal formula onto a, uh, a regular uh, grain? Again, I think this is going to vary <clears throat> um, from farm to farm. I feed one feed year-round to everyone. I don't change it. I, I, I think you get more issues if you're constantly changing what those animals are getting. All right, we're at 12% one day, we're at 15% the next day. Three weeks later, we're at 16%. So I have a 14% feed. That, that, that's what they're on from the day they're, they're born to the day the hammer falls. So no transition for me. Lois might be, and Mike might be totally different, but I'm steady as she goes. Yeah, we do use uh, Marin Foal generally up until right around, oh, February, March, when they become a yearling. Once they start into this time of year where their growth is coming on, that's generally when we'll pull them off. Ours are on a 14% cube uh, that we feed the mares. We don't use a full feed. And then um, I switch my, when I start yearling prep, I switch to sweet feed because I like to add oil and, you know, sometimes we'll add other supplements in, as needed. And I feel that mm -hmm. sweet feed carries it better and gets more delivered into the horse. Um, but I won't make that change. My horses are still in a cube right now. I'll start yearling prep next week and, and we'll switch them. You know, we'll do half and half for the first two weeks and make sure the tubs are clean before we go all the way to sweet feed. I, I just noticed that no wind issues, breathing issues were brought up. Can, can you maybe broach that subject? Well, we scope all of our foals, obviously, when we buy them. Um, mm -hmm. And we scope them all when we sell them. So uh, there, you know, you've got throats that are slow at, in a young horse, and you've got, um, basically, I guess you've got two issues. You've got 2B throats, which is, one, two A, two B, three, a three is a fail, a two B is an opens but it won't hold. So, um, you know, that's, that's one issue. In my experience those typically get worse, so I don't usually buy two B throats. Um, they're good throats to sell if you're a breeder because they're gonna get worse as a yearling, typically. Um, the other thing you have is immature epiglottises and, and foals. Um, you know, these problems are probably uh, very minor compared to what maybe what you're talking about, which is the the threes or the C grade throats. I mean, th those are horses that have a problem breathing, and um, you know, uh, I think breathing is definitely hereditary. Uh, I think uh, I've been told, and my experience is that bleeders, uh, horses that bleed badly, may have breathing problems also, and that they may contribute. Um, so I, th I think those are genetic 
questions. Um, as far as raising a horse, you know, it's, uh, I guess, I don't know, if, if you've got a horse that, that had really bad rotococcus or really bad lung issues, could he have, um, he's, he's still gonna scope okay, but are his lungs gonna be as good? I, I think that's probably a good developmental question. I'm always amazed, and I wonder if you guys have thought of this at all, uh, that people, because I believe it's genetic also, uh, you see mares that you have for years and they throw the same kind of throat all the time, you know, that you could drive a Mack truck through, perfect epiglottis, see other mares that, you know, throw the opposite. Uh, yet people buying mares, I never no see them, them scope them. Mm -hmm. Unraced mares, well yeah, bred. What do you guys think of that? I, I, I scope them. Well, I think if you're looking at, I, I tend to like race mares. So if you have race mares and you're doing research on their race records and they were, you know, um, above average race horses, then they could probably breathe okay. You know, especially if they had extended racing careers. The problem is, is when you're looking at unraced mares um, that come from good families, then a, lo a lot of times if you're gonna spend a lot of money, I will scope a mare. Um, and like you said, from a breeder standpoint, Sometimes if you get a mare that just gets a bad throat they, and they get one or two bad throats, they're probably going to continue to get bad throats. So you should really think about selling that mare because it is, it is something that they, that they can pass on.